Hey, this is Nick with the Biblical Languages Podcast, and before we dive into this episode, I have just two quick things to share with you. First, I want to make sure you know that we publish show notes with every single episode. Sometimes these will just include a summary of the episode along with any resources or research that we mention, Uh, or if the episode covers more technical material, we may include a glossary of technical terms or even a full blog post that unpacks the concepts more. A link to the show notes should be included in the description of each episode wherever you're listening. Second, we're hosting a linguist lab on lexical semantics on Thursday, October 28th at 3 p.m. Eastern. The purpose of the linguist lab is to take the concepts we've discussed in this podcast series and apply them to real Greek and Hebrew examples. This is a live event, so you'll be able to engage and ask questions. You can register using the link in the description of this podcast episode. Now, let's dive into the episode. Welcome to the Biblical Languages Podcast, brought to you by Biblingo. I am Kevin Grosso, your host for this episode, and I'm excited to talk with Rainier Dubloy today about Biblical Hebrew lexicography. Welcome to the show, Rainier. Thank you. So, just a little bit about Rainier. He is a Dutchman with a master's in African language and linguistics and a PhD in Hebrew linguistics. He was first a missionary for Bible translation in Nigeria, and then he became a translation consultant for UBS in African countries, and then the head of UBS's department creating technology for Bible translation. And he's currently the director of the Knight Institute for Biblical Scholarship at the American Bible Society, as well as the academic director of the International Training Program for the Jerusalem Center for Bible Translation. So he has, all that to say, a lot of experience in the world of Bible translation. Um, And what we are going to talk today about is his dictionary called the Semantic Dictionary of Biblical Hebrew, correct? That's very correct. So um, this is a, you know, new, well, I say it's new, it's, it's, been around a while, but it's uh, currently in progress as well. Um, so I thought we would start out by just talking a little bit about the impetus behind, um, you know, why you felt th- the need for another, you know, dictionary of biblical Hebrew, right? We have um, several. Um, so in, in that vein, what, what are some of the problems with the current biblical Hebrew dictionaries on the market or, or how could they be improved? Thank you, Kevin. Uh, The main problem is that many of the more traditional dictionaries that are around are not really based on a solid contemporary linguistic framework. You can find a lot of philological, etymological information. And I'm not saying that information is unimportant, but it does mean that word meanings are primarily defined on the basis of their cognates in other languages and often on the presumed meaning of a postulated root. Traditional dictionaries, they contain a lot of morphological information. Some of them are pretty good at syntax, but there it often ends. It is as if every aspect of language, like phonology, morphology, syntax, and so on, is considered to be structured except meaning. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that cognitive linguistics teaches us is that meaning has a structure as well. So each entry in a dictionary should benefit from a structural semantic analysis making use of contemporary linguistic criteria and i'm afraid that is often missing yeah that's it's interesting that you say that because you know you you would think that the meaning component of dictionaries is the most important part but what you're suggesting is that in current dictionaries that has really been kind of sidelined for the sake of phonology you know, etymology, those kinds of things. Is that kind of what you're saying? That's what I'm kind of saying, yeah. So so then how does the Semantic Dictionary of Biblical Hebrew, right? I mean, obviously, by the name itself, we, we get an idea of, of what you're trying to get after. How does that solve that basic problem? Yeah, you know, some people are puzzled by the name because they say a semantic dictionary should by default be semantic. Isn't every dictionary semantic? Well, our underlying goal is to determine how the meaning of a particular entry, a lexeme, is embedded within the entire system of experiences, beliefs, and practices. I mean, the entire worldview that was shared by the original speakers. 
Now I realize that that's a tall order because those speakers are no longer around. You cannot hold a mic under their noses and ask them what they meant, what was going on in their brain when they said certain things or when they penned down certain words. So the only thing we have is a limited set of data. Of course, we have the Tanakh itself, we have the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have some inscriptions, but that's about it. And that's not very much to go by. But the good news is, is that we have linguistics, and cognitive linguistics especially, that provides us with a number of excellent and very reliable tools that allow us to catch some glimpses of the world behind each word, so to speak. Each dictionary entry requires a structural semantic analysis. When it comes to dictionary making, morphology is of interest, syntax can be important, but semantics is supreme, and hence the name Semantic Dictionary of Biblical Hebrew. So, so is it right to say then, um, just from a higher level perspective, that the basic idea behind the dictionary is to come up with um, you know, the sort of structures from cognitive linguistics, the semantic structures that we get, and then apply that to biblical Hebrew, assuming that, you know, I mean, you would have to make this assumption, right, that the semantic structures that are developed in, in cognitive linguistics for modern languages um, would at least have some carryover to to biblical Hebrew. Is that that kind of the, um, the basic outline of, of what you're trying to do? Yeah, that's the basic outline of what we are trying to do. I mean, language is a feature of the, of, the, of the human mind. And that is what cognitive linguistics is really looking at. We are trying to look through language into the mind of the speaker. And of course, we are severely handicapped when it comes to biblical Hebrew because we don't have the speakers, but we have their utterances. So we're trying to apply cognitive linguistic principles to uh, research and to investigate uh, and analyze those utterances and try to see what we can find behind those utterances. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I mean I, in my own research, I, I completely agree that I think the um, there, of course, you know, there are going to be differences across languages, right? Um, but there are a striking number of similarities in how languages work and in how humans form meanings, right? Um, and so if you can pick up on those kinds of similarities, then there's really no reason why, you know, with a, it would be different with a dead language like biblical Hebrew. Um, so, so then let's, let's talk a little bit more about the actual dictionary. So like, okay, you, you're talking about this semantic structure. So what are some of the distinctive features of, of the semantic dictionary of biblical Hebrew? Yeah. Well, let's start with the distinction between lexical and contextual meaning. Right, that, that's the basic one. You know, you need to realize that meaning is found at different levels and in different colors and shades of colors. There are some people who say that there is no meaning without context. And to a certain extent that is true. But the question is whether, how do you define context? Traditionally, we define context, well, you have the text and the words that are surrounding it. Those, those are seen as the context and, and that's what we're investigating. But I would like to redefine the word context. Context includes more than what you hear or see in the text. It includes everything we know about the text. And you could call this the cognitive context. When you and I are in a conversation, the success of the conversation depends to a large extent on a certain quantity of shared background knowledge, mm -hmm. shared context about the thing that we're talking about. So to give you an example, when you and I are in a conversation, and I mentioned the word table without any preceding or following text. The conversation is not entirely meaningless because it's very likely that this word table will produce an image in your mind. I cannot look into your mind, but I, I think that with your mind's eye, you will see a flat surface with four legs or something like that. Yeah, that's, that's because of this good, this <laughs> cognitive context that we share together. And that would probably be the most prototypical meaning of the concept of the table as it, as it exists in, in your mind and in mine. So that's an example of a lexical meaning. It's a meaning that exists in your memory that can stand for itself with a minimum of additional context. And one word can have more than one lexical meaning, right? In most cases, those other meanings, I would like to characterize them as extensions of meaning of the prototypical meaning. With a bit of effort, you will realize that the word table is also used to describe something like, well, 
set of facts and figures that are displayed systematically in a book on a piece of paper, right? Or if you think further, you may also remember that there's something like a multiplication table and, and things like that. I would call those lexical meanings. They exist primarily in the cognitive mind, context of the speaker. On the other hand, you have the contextual meaning, but that focuses on those aspects of a meaning that become salient when we study a word in the actual context in which it is used. Like, let's go back to the table. Uh, uh, we may distinguish between there's the dining room table and the coffee table and the picnic table, depending on their actual use, and they may have a slightly different shape, even though they share this, this basic gestalt, as they often call it, of the table that we have in our minds. And of course, you know, there is not always a clear cut distinction between lexical and contextual meanings, uh, but there are some criteria that can be used to distinguish between, between the two. So, so let's, let's think about this table example a little bit more. So we, if we say that, you know, a sort of prototypical meaning um, of table is, you know, a uh, something with four legs and, you know, a flat surface on the top. I, 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 I'm I thinking about, in particular, you know, some of the, like, archaeological discoveries in in uh, in Israel, right? And, and, and in, in houses, whether or not they actually ate on a, what we would consider prototypical table, right? And, and I've, I've, I've seen places that suggest that they would, you know, eat on the floor. And, in fact, in places in the Middle East... Right, they still do. Right, they'll they'll have a mat on the floor, um, and that'll serve as the shulchan. Right, um, so 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 would that just in in this to, to help explain this idea would that be a lexical or contextual meaning or how, how does that fit into this sort of dichotomy? Well, you know, maybe we it's not a dichotomy. So it, that's another. Or we distinction. have been talking about English so far. You know, we talk about English and what you and I have in, have in common. We come from similar cultures. But yeah, of course, uh, for the shulchan, it would be a totally different thing, right? We would have to look at whatever evidence we can find about the shulchan. And you mentioned archaeological evidence, which makes more most sense in, in this particular case. And you can look at the biblical text where the word shulchan is, is found and try to find out what the shulchan used to mean in, in, in those particular days. Uh, but the same principle applies to it. I would also think that you would have the shulchan as a lexical meaning, and we probably have some related words, words that are part of the same semantic domain. We haven't talked about that yet. Um, and there would be contextual meanings of it. And in many cases, the information is limited. I mean, there's the word shulchan that is found in Psalm 23 and, and, and things like that. And yeah, we would really have to base that on information provided by the text or whatever other data that we have. Right, right. So in your actual dictionary, then, you are marking out both lexical and contextual meanings for each word. That's right. That's right. Yes. And we use uh, semantic domains in that, in that particular context. So, right. So then what is the semantic domain then? Okay, let's go. The semantic domains, they play a real a key role in this discussion. In a way, words are just like people. Uh, humans function best if they're part of a community. Well, in a way, one could say that the same is true for words. They are usually part of some sort of semantic grouping. And you actually need an entire group of words in order to be able to give a helpful definition of one of the members of that group. Right? If, for instance, you come from Mars to this Earth and you are interested in the fruits that we eat in this world, you come to me. And you ask me, you know, what is an apple? Well, if I think only of the apple, I can give you a description of the meaning of an apple. But it would probably not be very helpful and it would not be possible for you to distinguish the apple from the orange and from the peach and, and things like that. Because I think only of this particular thing. If I really want to give you a good description of what an apple is, I have to look at the entire semantic domain for the apple and have to compare it with the orange and the strawberry and the cherry and the blueberry and whatever fruit there is. In that way, only you can talk about the color and the size and the taste and the, 
um, the structure, whether it has seeds or no seeds and things like that, then I can give you a good description which will help you identify the apple. So semantic domains are very important, especially in a dictionary, because I can give you the meaning of one particular word in Hebrew, like mishpat, which is complicated enough because it's a polysemous word, but I can only do this properly if I compare mishpat with some of the other words that are found in the same context, like this tzedakah, and, and, and other words. That will really help. So that's why we work with semantic domains. So, so then really the, the value of a semantic domain from your perspective is to, is to differentiate like words, right? Or words that fall in that same domain. Is that right? Yes. And it's very important also for Bible translators. That's, of course, the, the area that I'm most interested in. I mean, if you translate one word, and you look for an equivalent into another language, you know, you want to know all the different nuances that distinguish this word from its brothers and sisters, so to speak, that are part of the same semantic domain. I cannot look for a translation of mishpat into English if I only if I don't look at tzedakah as well. So because I need to have two separate equivalents in most cases for both words. Right, right. And of course, you know, you can run into all kinds of problems in translation with imperfect matches between the two, um, you know, pairs and yeah. Yeah. So that that's that, that's great. So 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 then you also have this notion of a lexical domain. Um, what what is a what is a lexical domain and how does that relate to the semantic domain? Yeah, well, the lexical domain is one type of semantic domain. And it's a term that I'm using is kind of a lexical graphical term, but it actually uh, refers to what is called uh, a cognitive category in cognitive linguistics. There's been a lot of research showing that human beings, they love to categorize things. We love to put things in boxes, you know? It's a natural process and we are not often even aware that we are doing this in our minds. We see what is happening around us, and we like to turn whatever we see into a well-organized system. Like if, for instance, I would bring you into a, a room or a building that is full of different objects of all kinds, who they're in some kind of haphazard way, and I would ask you to organize it, you would have no difficulty doing that. And you would do that in a way that would make sense within the reality as you perceive it. Like, you would put the apple with the orange and the peach and the cherry. And you see a sheep and a cow and a donkey, and you would put those together in a group of domestic animals. And then, of course, you would run into a pig. What would you do with the pig? If you would do this as an American, you would probably put it together with a cow and a sheep, right? If you were an ancient Israelite, you would not be inclined to group the pig with those other animals. You wouldn't do that. It wouldn't make sense. It would be actually be abomination. You would have at least two groups of animals. In one corner, you put the clean animals and the unclean animals in the other corner. So in every culture or group, they categorize things in different ways. But those groupings are incredibly important because they are part of the foundation of the underlying culture. And therefore, they are reflected in the, reflected in the language. You know, languages usually have specific generic terms for each group. Or subgroup. And for every item in one of those groups, you are able to list certain expressions and related expressions. They have synonyms, they have antonyms. And if someone asks you the difference between an apple and an orange, it will be easy to do, much easier than if somebody would ask you, what's the difference between an apple and a car? Because they are completely unrelated concepts, and it's very hard to explain one in terms of the other. That would absolutely not make sense. So this concept behind each word is a member of a cognitive category or a lexical semantic domain. It's actually the same thing, but I'm looking at it from either a lexical graphical perspective or a cognitive linguistic perspective. So, so then this cognitive category really is culture dependent, right? Yes, most certainly. Yeah, so, so, so then how does that relate to what you call a contextual domain. Okay, yeah, that's the next step. A lexical or contextual semantic domain is another lexical graphical term for something that in cognitive linguistics is often called a cognitive frame. 
And in many ways, you could literally think of it as a picture frame. I mean, that, that works well. This is cognitive linguistics, everything thing has to do with our minds and the images that things evoke in our minds. Let's take a term, she. Right? For the ancient Israelites, a sheep belonged to the lexical semantic domain or cognitive category of domestic animals, together with the cow and the goat and the donkey and not the pig. Right? The term sheep would evoke many images in the minds of the speakers of ancient Hebrew, many of those frames. And reading and studying the Old Testament allows me to reproduce some of those pictures, even if I'm not an Israelite from biblical times. Like I can see a picture on the wall of my mind right out of Psalm 23. Right? I see the shepherd wearing his, uh, carrying a staff. I see a desert and some small patches of grass and other plants. I see some water, if I'm lucky, right? I see a dark valley that scares the sheep. And yet the shepherd is able to give them a sense of security while going through there. So that would be one contextual domain in which the word sheep functions. That I would call that, let's say, the domain of shepherding. But that's just one picture. Next to this picture on the wall, I see another one. I see an altar. I see a heap of stones somewhere on a hill. I see a sheep. I do not hear it bleeding, though. And then there's a man with a sharp knife who kills a sheep and he cuts the meat, burns it on the altar. I see the blood. I see the fire. I smell the smoke. I smell the incense, maybe. It's the same sheep, but it's a different picture. And that would be another contextual domain, the domain of sacrifice. It doesn't change the meaning of sheep, the lexical meaning, but the contextual meaning is clearly different here. And each of these pictures brings different concepts together. They are related because together they form an image. Picture on the wall of my mind, so to speak. And those are contextual domains. So, okay, so l l let's try to kind of like, I'm trying to wrap my head around all of these different categories, right? So we have lexical versus contextual meaning, right? Um, and then we have lexical versus contextual domains. So the, back to the sheep example, the, the contextual meaning of a sheep in the contextual domain of sacrificing is the sacrifice itself is that is that right well um i'm trying to understand your your question i mean they are groupings right uh, lexical do uh, domain has groupings like lexical domain of wheat would have would be groupings of wheat and corn and millet and, and things like that those are kind of related things. You could call this a paradigmatic relationship between certain terms. I would like to describe the contextual domains as a syntagmatic relationship between things. And if we take the sacrifice as an example, the sheep, the sacrificial animal, it's a grouping of different terms, but they're not necessarily related terms in the lexical sense, but in the contextual sense. So the sheep would be part of this domain. But if I would click in that domain in my dictionary, it would form, show me different words as well. The word priest would pop up. The word altar would pop up. The word knife would pop up. The word fire would pop up. And some verbs as well. I mean, killing or slaughtering, cutting, smelling. There would be nouns and verbs and adjectives and adverbs and everything is part of the same picture. So it's simply another way of grouping words. And those two perspectives are, in a way, a simplification of what really happens in the mind. You know, you cannot just simply say, well, there's the paradigmatic way of grouping, there's the syntagmatic way of grouping. Of course, in the mind, it's way more complicated than that. At the same time, when you write a dictionary, you want to simplify things to an extent that people can do something with it. Right. So that's what you're trying to do. Right. So I, I'm thinking about uh, comparing a sheep to a horse. So if you said a horse... Right, so so those would be in the same lexical domain, right? Let's say of would they? I I I would put them in the same lexical domain. <laughs> so so I I'm trying to think of a domestic animal, right? That wouldn't be a sacrifice. Um, so so let, let's just so I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe you don't put those in the in the same domain in in uh, 
biblical Hebrew, you wouldn't do that? Well, a horse is a bit of a problem. I mean, you know, not in your culture, maybe in, I mean, not in mine, but in the ancient Israelite culture, a horse was, was problematic. You see, even the kings are told not to invest in horses and, and things like that, because, you know, this is kind of counter to trusting the Lord and things. So I would be, maybe it would be a domestic an, uh, animal. It would be part of the same lexical domain, but it would certainly be on the fringe of it. Right. Really on the margin. It's there simply because we have no better place. But of course, the contextual domains in which the horse is found are very different. The primary contextual domains would be kind of traveling, where you're riding a horse or a horse is pulling your chariot. And the other one would be uh, warfare, of course. I mean, those would be contexts like pictures on your wall where you see a horse. And uh, Maybe there are a few more. There could be the commerce domain where somebody is actually going somewhere to buy a horse. Some of those things are, are there. So, so maybe, maybe a, a donkey is a better example. If we say donkey and sheep are both you know, in a similar lexical domain of domesticated animals, but, but donkey wouldn't be found in the contextual domain of sacrificing, right? Whereas a sheep would be. So... So in this case, what we're doing, I, I think, if I'm understanding you correctly, is is mapping out for for the word sheep, right? We would say, okay, um, it's in a it's in a contextual domain that is um, that has all of this, I don't know, baggage, right? Um, all all of this information that people intuitively understand about sacrifices, right? Um, just are automatically connected with this this idea of cheap, right? But but all of that is not connected at all to donkeys. Even though even though donkeys and sheep have something in common in, in the sense that they're both lexically, you know, might fit into the domesticated animal category. Yeah. You would never see them in a picture like that. Right. Right. So that that's really helpful. And and I and I I think, you know, this is really obvious when um when you read other dictionaries right? That this kind of information isn't present, <laughs> right? Um, so this would be the, you know, new thing, at least one new thing um, that you're, that you're offering because, you know, I, th I think for, for most people, it's, it's kind of assumed or even, even the idea of the horse, right? Um, you know, I, as I, as I thought about that, I, I, I was trying to think of animals, right? That would fit this category, but it's actually, um, very hard for me as an English speaker not to put in my idea of horse, right, onto Seuss. Um, and and that's that's probably, you know, I mean, well, that is obviously influencing my my interpretation of of the word. Um, so so yeah, that's that's great. So I guess I guess one of the questions with this, right, is is how many lexical domains? so if if, you know, we're we're looking at these words, and they're, you know, based on, um, you know, certain cognitive categories. Like, how many lexical, lexical domains are there in biblical Hebrew, and and how do we decide when, you know, two words are in a lexical domain together or not? Yeah, well, that that's a great question. Of course, uh, I haven't counted them, but there are many lexical domains in biblical Hebrew, but they are all derived from one basic. Domain. And that's kind of a universal domain and cognitive linguistic linguists claim that as well. That's the domain of space. Because everything that happens in this world is, is, is happening in, in, in the, within the domain of space. So all objects and events, if you use that term, are found there. And then for objects, we can start distinguishing between supplements. Like there's the beings, there's vegetation, there's products, there's substances scenery, like the things we see around us in the world, and so on. And then for events, we go in a different direction. Within even events, I distinguish between four subdomains. One of is the most prototypical one, position, that's linked to space. Then there's connection, there's perception, and description. But then it goes on and on. For each of these, there are subdomains at multiple levels, sometimes up to six levels. And these domains can be justified by a structural semantic analysis of Hebrew data, right? Like, for starters, Hebrew has many generic terms. If you read Genesis 1 or Leviticus 11, 
or Deuteronomy 14, you can find out a lot about plants, but especially about animals. And you find some generic terms, like you find there's a category called Hayat Hasade, there's the Behema, there's the Remes, there's the Sheretz. Apparently, those are categories. This means that in the minds of the speakers, it would make sense to consider these, like the Hayat Hasade as a wild animal, Behema is commonly used for domestic animals. The remes are, yeah, what are they? Um, some people say they are reptiles. That's probably not entirely true because it seems that mice and rats are also remes because they have short legs, almost invisible legs. And then there's the sherets, the, the insects, whether they are in the air or in, in the water or things like that. So that's one area where you can say, okay, these are obviously categories. And then, of course, we have Hebrew poetry. Thank God for poetry. Two-thirds of the Old Testament is poetry. And poetry has these wonderful parallelisms. Uh, Hebrew needs more than one word for everything because otherwise they cannot make a parallelism. Out of it, right? So they have all these synonyms and sometimes antonyms. And you can be pretty sure that those are part of the same lexical domain. Uh, like if you take a word like mishpat, we mentioned it before, you see that mishpat and tzedakah are often used together as a word pair or in a parallelism. And the same is true for chesed and emeth. And on the basis of that, you can be pretty sure that those words that are used in one breath, so to speak, are part of the same lexical domain. So the more you dive into the poetry, you can find out how words are grouped together. So that is such a tremendous help that in, in other dead languages, you would probably not find that. But Hebrew it helps you a lot. Yeah, that's it's really interesting too because um, you know obviously there's been a lot of work done on parallelism in Hebrew, and you know I I think I think from a very naive perspective people just kind of say oh well they're synonyms right and they move on, but but if they're in the same lexical domain, I I mean I I think if I'm if I'm following the logic they would be slightly different right. And they, they would be in, in a same category, right? That, you know, again, it's like farm animals, right? Each farm animal is slightly different, right? But but they have this overarching, you know, thing that unifies them. So when we think of Mishpat and Staka, like, you know, you have like something that is is unifying them, right? But they're not they're not the same. And actually if you look at their uses, right, they're they're not the same, right? Um yeah. So, so it's interesting that you we we can use this parallelism not not only to, um, you know, tease apart domains, but also to tease apart differences, right? I mean, if 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 that makes sense. Yeah, sometimes you can do that, and not every context is very helpful. And of course, if you have a word pair like chesed emet, you have to ask yourself what is really happening there. Are those words listed together because of their differences in meaning? Or are these words listed together because they actually reinforce the meaning of one another, right? So these are questions that that come up. Sometimes right. it's easier to see the differences if the words are used in a kind of isolated sense in different contexts, rather than when they are used together. That kind of blurs the differences sometimes. So right. that focuses more on what they have in common rather than what the difference is. Right, right. And it wouldn't necessarily, you know, obviously you'd have to pay careful attention to the context to, to know, you know, parse that out. So, so that's a little bit more about lexical domains. Um, so let's, let's talk more about contextual domains. So how do we distinguish between a contextual domain and a context? So I'll, I'll give an example, like back to our sheep and donkey, right? Let's say you have an Israelite who sacrifices a donkey, right? Because, um, or sacrifices a pig, right? Um, he's, you know, worshiping a foreign god and he makes a sacrifice, right? So at what point, I mean, we've said, right, that according to an Israelite, um, or at least an Orthodox one, like they, they wouldn't um, necessarily associate donkeys and pigs with this contextual domain of sacrifice, right? But if someone does that, and it's written down and we have evidence of it, how, how, how do we 
do we call that a contextual domain or do we call that, you know, just a random instance of this? Like, um, when do we call a certain um, instance of something a, a real contextual domain? Yeah, well, that, that is a, that's a great question. Um, I always like to go back to this picture and, and the image, right? Um, in, in principle, in a living language, there could be an infinite number of pictures on the wall of your mind. There is just no limit because anything can happen. Any word can be used in, 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 in together. Even if it's, not, if it's not in real life, it could happen in your imagination or things like that. You dream things that don't always make sense, right? If you have to paint a picture for every dream that you've ever had, that would be problematic. Now, we're kind of lucky because we have this limited corpus of the Bible. In many ways, that's a blessing because you only have the data that are actually there. So in, in, in principle, everything that is found in the text, every situation that we see described could be a separate contextual domain. And yeah, that is problematic. But we need to realize that many of the situations described in the Bible are actually intersections of different situations. Let me give you another example. Um, let's take the cognitive frame or the contextual domain for circumcision, right? Could be described as a single domain. Uh, with our mind's eye, we can take a picture of it, we can frame it and hang it on our wall. And we have certain terms that are there, you know, there's the baby, the man, and the blood, and the knife, and, and stuff like that, and maybe the crying of the baby, it's there. At the same time, this domain is related to this childbirth domain in a slightly different sense, because it happens, you know, eight days after the birth of the child. And there is a parenthood domain as well that plays a role here. And there's the age domain as well. They're all contextual domains that have something to do with this particular situation. So in many cases, we can take some of the more prototypical, if you will, pictures and describe other situations that are less common as combinations of some of those pictures where different uh, pictures play a role at, uh, at the same time. So like the example that you came of the sacrifice of a donkey, well, that would be part of the regular sacrifice domain, but it would be another intersecting domain, and that's the domain of morals and ethics, or the domain of the law, the Torah, because this guy is doing something which is absolutely wrong. So all those things play a role in that particular context. So we can actually yeah, add up a number of, contextual domains to describe a particular situation. So you don't have to have a unique one for everything because that would be unworkable and it wouldn't work. I mean, it, also in the dictionary, it would be useless. And you need to realize that certain words are so common that they can function in a million contextual domains. And to list that for that word is not practical. Like take a verb like haya or lakach. They have such a generic meaning. If I would list all the semantic contextual domains in which hayar is found, it wouldn't help anybody. Because if you turn this around, you click on that particular domain, and then you want to get the terms that are relevant to that domain. If I click on sacrifice, I want to get some of the words that are relevant to sacrifice. I wouldn't be interested in lakach. I wouldn't be interested in haya because that doesn't add anything to my knowledge. So for certain words, we list only lexical meanings and we don't even bother about contextual meanings because it's not helpful. Huh. Yeah. I mean, and, and that makes sense, right? That, that there would be some words. I mean, I, I mean, thinking even, even from a grammatical perspective of like light verbs, you know, um, you know, they're just, they're so, so common. Um, I mean, I think if you have a, if you have a very underspecified meaning, then it can be used in almost any context is the idea. Um, right. So, so, so that's with the, the domain. So let's, I'd like to take a, a little bit closer look at, um, senses. And this is a, a well-known thorny problem, <laughs> right? In lexicography and lexical semantics, what is a sense and how do we distinguish them, um, you know, I mean, it's just there's there's all kinds of not so simple questions. So I just pulled up, you know, in your in your dictionary, an example of of right father. Um, and you have 
two senses, right? Uh, I mean, you have multiple senses, but two senses that to me seemed quite similar. So in D, it was the first to be engaged in a certain activity or pattern of behavior. Um, and E was, you know, someone who is the originator of a certain process, right? So, so can you just walk through um, kind of your thought process on, you know, why you would separate these two senses um, and, and just, just to help us understand, okay, like, how do we do this on a, on a practical basis with, you know, these senses that are, that are close, but what you're saying are, are, you know, not close enough. Okay. Well, let me backtrack a little bit because the first thing you need to do is to establish the prototypical sense of the word. Right? If the word is polysemous, I'd like to think that there is one prototypical sense and everything else is more or less derived from it. So once you have established the prototypical, you know, you go through all the contexts where half is found and there's what, 1200 or something like that. So that's a lot of work. But we do that, we go through every verse. So, and then you see in most cases, well, the word af refers to the father, but then the father in the sense of, you know, the direct male progenitor. And uh, so, yeah, after seeing a couple of examples, you kind of say, okay, well, that's a prototypical sense. And once you have settled that, you know, you, yeah, you have given it a, de a definition, you describe what it really means. Don't just put father there because that's very confusing. Father can mean so many things. Uh, so once you have clarity about that, you go through the other passages. You start comparing different usages of the word with the prototypical meaning, and you look for structural differences, and primarily semantic differences. You look at a passage, you ask yourself, you know, is this particular usage covered by the definition that I have? If not, I might need to adjust the definition a little bit, or I may conclude, hey, this is a different thing altogether. And sometimes even the difference in, in grammar can help to see that, but in most cases, I'm looking for semantic differences. And uh, sometimes it helps to look at um, antonyms and, and synonyms to, to get a little bit more clarity. So now let's look at this particular case. Um, again, we have said, well, we've kind of established what's the prototypical meaning for, for af, but then you start looking at Genesis 4. And there is this, these men who are called the father of the people who play a musical instrument, or the father of the people who do this and this. And then you see already, okay, this basic substance of, this is not necessarily the biological father that we're talking about. This is a father, the initiator of a certain lifestyle, certain activity, the first musician, the first blacksmith. So you know already that this is a different sense from the prototypical meaning of, of father. So that, that helps. And that takes care of D. But then we go to E. And then, of course, you look at some of the references. And you see a case like in Job 38, verse 28, where God is described as the father of the rain. And they say, okay, well, it is certainly not a prototypical sense of, of father. And then you compare it with what happens in Genesis 4. Is that the father of a certain activity or lifestyle? No, rain is not an activity or a lifestyle. It is, it is something else. And then you find out that this is more in the contextual domain of creation. And uh, so this, this helps you to set up those, those, those differences of uh, different lexical meanings. Lexical yeah. So, so do, is it fair to say that, I mean, do lexical, I mean, do senses have to be in different contextual domains or no? Very often they are. Very often they are, and contextual domains certainly can help distinguish between, between different senses. But I wouldn't say that that is always the case. Right. Yeah, no, and, and, that, and that makes sense, right? That you, even in, even in something like, like the word sheep, right, you can call it a sacrifice, um, but you really can't call a, uh, I mean, you wouldn't normally call a donkey a sacrifice because it wouldn't be in that domain, right? Um, so, so then what, what we would say is that, I mean, in this case anyway, um, the senses are of sheep are, are based on the contextual domain, right? On, on it having 
a function that's different than donkey? Yes, well, that would be one of the, the different aspects, of course. In the definition, I usually look at four elements. I look at the, the shape, the physical shape or the description. I look at what I call the source, like where does it come from? How is it made? Which, of course, doesn't apply in the case of sheep and donkeys that much. Then you have the function that is kind of the man-made human functions of something. What do you use it for? And then you have the connotation. The connotation is more like, how do people regard that? Like a pig would by default be seen as a filthy animal. Uh, the function would be, you cannot eat it because uh, things like that and, and so on and so forth. So we try to do this in a structural way. Right, right. And that, and that again, makes a lot of sense. And, and I, you know, I imagine if you looked at every single word through those lenses, right, you're going to come up with a lot of distinctions Right, that are going to be really helpful, you know, between between words. Um, so, so another, you know, related issue, and this is a really key concept in cognitive linguistics in general, is is metaphor. Um, so, you know, even even in the example, um, you know, that we just discussed with of, right, the first to be engaged in a certain activity or pattern of behavior, um, or the originator of a certain process, like. Is this metaphor, <laughs> right? Um, I mean, if, if we, I mean, I, I, I could see it, you know, in, in one of two ways, right? We can say something like it's it's a metaphorical use of a, you know, the the main sense, right, of male progenitor, or it's, you know, that word is, is like radically underspecified, <laughs> right? And it can just mean something like any originator, something like that. Um, so, so how, how do we define this, this concept of metaphor, um, and, and how is this incorporated into, into the dictionary? Yeah, that's a great one. The metaphors, of course, are basically extensions of meaning. Uh, like you mentioned the two senses of af that we talked about, you know, traditionally, of course, when I was at primary school, when I learned what a metaphor is, we were talking about very specific figures of speech. Like when I say John is a chicken, right? I mean, that's very specific. And those are metaphors that are kind of accidents or incidents in, in, in language. Not John is like a chicken, which is a simile. <laughs> that would be a simile, right? And we have right, right. Those, uh, of, of, of those things. Cognitive linguistics uses the term in a way, yeah, in a much wider sense. And uh, SDBH follows this practice as well. We consider every extension of meaning of a single word some sort of metaphor. Because they're all fruits of the functions of the human mind. You see a process, an object or a process, and you perceive relationships between them. You start comparing the two. And then you may decide to use the same word for it. Like a chair, the basic meaning would be something to sit on. But there's also the chair as the person in charge of a meeting. Right, and there's a link between the two because it has to do with a certain seat, in a certain position, and somebody sitting on it. So, but there's a comparison. So you can address that person also as the chair of the meeting, and like with the tree, you know, you have a tree as this this thing that grows in nature, and then you have a tree diagram on a piece of paper that has those branches, and it looks like a tree. So you use the same word. So in SDBH, we describe these extensions of meaning as mappings from one domain. To another, and that can be a lexical domain, that can be a contextual domain. So, what happens in these cases of af as well? It's a mapping. There's the basic domain of father as a kinship term, and there's an extension to some of the other domains that are more directly associated with the activity that is in there. That's described in those verses that we talked about. So, then a key part to that, right, is actually determining the basic meaning. Right, yeah. because it, if if you don't determine the basic meaning, you can't know how the extensions of meaning are or what they're related to, right? Exactly. So, so really, that seems to be, um, well, and I think you mentioned this in your sort of methodology, right? That's kind of the first step. Yeah, that's where everything everything starts. That's absolutely key. So, so, and 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 part of these, um, you know, in these senses, in these definitions. Um, you actually write definitions rather than glosses. Um, so 
why do you do this? Um, you know, what are some advantages to doing this? Because most dictionaries, right, will will just do glosses. Most Hebrew dictionaries, <laughs> right? Yes, I'm afraid you're right. And I could have mentioned that earlier when we talked about the distinguish the, the distinctions between SDH and traditional lexicography. Yeah. You mentioned it's an advantage. I would rather say it's more than an advantage. It's a sheer necessity. I already alluded to this briefly in some of my previous answers. Um, yeah, they don't, they even, so those traditional dictionaries, they even call those definitions, right? If you talk to a lexicographer, what's the definition of yat in Hebrew? It's hand. And of course, that's not the definition. That's a gloss, right? It's a translation equivalent. They're not useless. They're needed. But those terms come with a lot of baggage, cognitive baggage. And that is where the, the confusion comes from, because they differ from one language and culture to another. Like I could do my research of the Hebrew word yad, and I could just say, well, it means hand in English. But then I'm misleading myself already, because even though those two concepts have a lot in common, they are also quite different. The English word hand can be used in ways that do not apply to the Hebrew word yad, and vice versa. Uh, like in, the Hebrew yad actually includes the wrist because you can wear a bracelet on your yad, and it possibly includes the entire lower arm. There's even one verse in Jeremiah somewhere that could, you know, imply that it means the entire arm, um, and that works in Hebrew, but not necessarily in English. Like. The actual relationship between yacht and hand could be described as a Venn diagram. There's a lot of overlap in the center, but there's a significant amount of differences on the fringes. So while doing my analysis of af, I could say it means father, but then already I'm lost because there are many cases where in English you can use the word father, like God is the father of the rain, but I would kind of lose track of the fact that this is a different lexical meaning altogether. And it may not work in another language at all. We are talking about different things. So if right from the beginning, I start with the definition and say, okay, when we talk about father in this prototypical sense, it has this meaning and this meaning and this meaning, that's part of it. This is the description, this is the source, this is the function, this is the connotation. And then I go on and start looking at the other passages and see to what extent they fit the mold or whether they don't fit the mold. And that is really a reliable way to distinguish between different senses. So, so the basic problem with glosses then is, I mean, d d just the, the fact that the, the target language word is never going to map one to one onto the, the source word, right? So if we have Yad and, and, and this is true of anyone who's, you know, read a decent amount of Hebrew, yad is not the same as hand, <laughs> right? In the in, Just in the sense that there's all kinds of extensions of meaning of yad that you really, if you translate as hand, won't make sense to your average <laughs> native speaker of English. Yeah. Yeah. So, so then in your definition, what you're trying to do is, is describe the the meaning in such a way that those um, those extensions of meaning are, you know, kind of laid out on the table. Is that is that the idea or laid out on the table? That's a good good metaphor. Is it so 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 it, it, if you're in your definition for yad, right? Like how how would that distinct like um yeah how would that be different than your your gloss for yad of hand? Well, I would keep more than one gloss to begin with. So I would describe it, and uh, I would have to look it up, but it would be something like uh, one of the two extensions of the body from the shoulder or something like that, or the lower part of, of, of or I would say the lower part of the arm or, or things like that. And then in the glosses, I would include hand, but also wrist and lower arm, because those are, you know, yeah, possible, equi uh, possible equivalents, translation equivalents in certain contexts. So, right. and... The combination of the definition and the glosses gives the user a lot of insight. We need to re remember that many of our dictionary users are not necessarily English speakers, and they still use a Hebrew English dictionary. And whatever applies to English would not apply to their mother tongue either. So the more information they have, the better they can find an equivalent that 
fits their mother tongue. Yeah, yeah, that that makes sense. And I mean, even you know, using multiple glosses along with the definition, you know, obviously just more information and more clarity. Um, so, so what about idioms? Um, this is something that I really, when I go to dictionaries, I I don't know why. <laughs> Sometimes I can't find things because, um, you know, you just the way that Hebrew dictionaries are parsed sometimes um you know they're not gonna usually parse out an idiom right um i i was i was reading exodus and i had this example me bite umi hoots right and and it was very clear inside and outside right um and and it's something that like you know for for if if i was trying to sit figure out okay how do you say inside in in biblical hebrew um, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to find it right because I wouldn't be able to because me bite is not in a separate entry right and I would never like as an English speaker I would never think oh I'll look under the entry bite and see if there's any sort of combination with prepositions that really means inside <laughs> right um, and even in English right inside <laughs> right I, I don't I don't think of that composition i don't think of side and then plus in um and we would we would put that in our dictionary right in english as a separate entry um so all that to say you treat idioms you know what what what, why do you do this and how how is that helpful yeah well in the first place one of the features of sdbh is that you can find we list every occurrence of every word that also means that if you're in a Hebrew text somewhere, you click on a word, you look it up in STBH, it would automatically bring you to the lexical meaning that it represents because everything is completely disambiguated. So that, that's one thing. So it would be easy to find. And of course, every dictionary also needs like Hebrew English or English Hebrew kind of list to help you find things. But that's beside the point. Now, idioms are like the metaphors that we just talked about. An idiom is kind of a collocation of different words that have a meaning that is different, or the total totality has a meaning that's different from the sum of the meanings of each individual word, right? You could say it in that way. So another good example is, you know, it's this land flowing with milk and honey. That obviously doesn't mean that there were rivers of milk and streams of honey in that place. It simply means that Canaan was a fertile and fruitful land. So yeah, this is a unit. It has lexical meaning as a unit. And that has to be there in the dictionary. And in this particular case, SDVH would list it under each of the words. It would be found under land, under Eretz, it would be found under Zavat, it would be found under Chalaf, it would be found under Devash. So Devash would have, well, maybe two lexical meanings. It would have the meaning like Devash as such, and it would have a lexical meaning that would take care of this idiom, a land flowing of milk and honey and move it into a different lexical semantic domain and give a definition that would make sense for that particular expression. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I think that's that's super helpful. I mean, even I'm thinking about, you know, again, Devash, right? Like, it, it, it makes sense that you would put it under that entry, right? But also as something that's separate because it's, you can't, it doesn't mean the same thing as honey <laughs> right i mean i mean it, it you can see the relation right um but you know just to to say that and obviously you know how we then translate that is a whole nother question um but but yeah i mean that's it's super helpful to just to just have it in there as a separate thing um because i think for for you know and a lot of and i think this is a historical problem too within dictionaries um, is that there's been so much attention on the root in Hebrew, um, you know, that people have built dictionaries around roots, right? Which there's advantages to that. Um, but, you know, when you when you only do that, then then you you run into to problems with bigger units, right? So so last sort of question as we wrap up here. Um, so you you're obviously putting in a lot of new information, right? And into you know your dictionary that that really has never been done before um on such a large scale you know i i can think of some studies you know cognitive linguistics 
based studies on individual words, um, but but definitely nothing in a dictionary, um, you know, full scale. So, is there anything at this point that you wish you could add to your dictionary that you that you aren't currently doing? Well, the first concern is to complete the dictionary, right? <laughs> right. Even this morning, before we had our call, I was working on a number of entries we need to have it finished. But the great thing here is that this dictionary is not created to be published on paper, right? It's an electronic database, which means that there's nothing that's stopping us from improving it forever and ever and ever. So we can add additional information at any time. And yes, of course, I would love to see more data added like more images. Uh, I would like to add more comparisons between Hebrew and their counterparts in the MXX, Septuagint, maybe some Syriac equivalents and, and things like that, just to give an example. And I really hope that this project will attract more people who say, well, you know, this is a great document, a great database to start with. I would love to contribute by adding this or this and this information. And these days we have computers, they can play a role. The database is set up in such a way that it's very easy to add information to it. It's not hard at all. And hopefully we can expand it into, yeah, some kind of exhaustive encyclopedic database of all Hebrew words and Aramaic words, by the way. So, yeah, I mean, I can't wait. So you're just looking for volunteers at this point. <laughs> I'm always looking for volunteers. So, um, just just uh, one one last question on that. How, how far along are you at this point? Um, it, it, it kind of depends. Uh, we have different levels in the semantic analysis. Uh, the first is do a basic semantic analysis, put in the different lexical meanings and assign them in the semantic domain. The second level is um, kind of adding definitions to each of to flesh out every lexical meaning. And then the third level is to add all the contextual meanings to it. And I must say that about 70% uh, of the dictionary has the full, you know, full, uh, yeah, the three stages completed. About 75% has the first two stages completed. And about 99% have the, the first stage completed. That the basic semantic analysis and the domain is there. That doesn't mean that the moment you start looking at these things in detail, you will not change things again. That that is going, yeah, continually happening. But in principle, just about every word, with maybe seventy words, seventy lexemes excluded, have a lexical domain attached to them. So that is that is something. Wow, that's exciting! Seventy words away. I mean, I'm sure there'll be a big party when uh, when those get done. Yeah, but you don't want to think of some of those words. One of them is the. <laughs> right, and there is a look <laughs> some of those words. So we're not ready to party yet. Right. Okay. You need you need more volunteers. <laughs> oh yeah. Great. So that's all we have time for on this episode of the Biblical Languages Podcast. Thank you, Rainier, for joining us. Okay, you're most welcome. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you to all of our listeners out there who have taken the time to listen to the Biblical Languages podcast brought to you by Biblingo. We hope you enjoyed the episode. <laughs>